All right, welcome to another edition of Agriscaping Podcast. This is Justin Rona, your host, and uh, we're going to talk a lot more about growing your own health, finding healthy ways to grow your life. And uh, I've got a special guest here with me. With it's uh, Dr. Cowan from uh, San Francisco. Am I right? That's correct. Yes. Now, Dr. Cowan's been a longtime holistic physician, and he lives and practices right there in San Francisco, specializing in helping people heal through diet and natural medicines. And his book, How and Why to Eat More Vegetables, describes why eating small amounts of a wide variety of vegetables is key to optimal health. And for all you guys out there, we, we know that a lot of the reason we do what we do in our gardens is so we can improve our own health. And uh, so I'm really excited to be able to talk to you a little bit more, Dr. Cowan, about uh, what you're doing, what you've been up to, and kind of um, how you've arrived at this, this, these products that you've, uh, you've got on your site. Okay. And um, Thank guess, you for having me on your show. <laughs> you're welcome. Now, where did this all start for you um, in the Dr. Cowan's garden? Uh, Dr. Cowan's garden probably started, uh, the idea started probably 40 years ago. Uh, I was actually in the Peace Corps teaching gardening, not that I knew much about gardening, but at, when I was in the Peace Corps, I was exposed to the work of, uh, Weston Price. And, uh, basically what that showed me was that, uh, there is a way that human beings have eaten that has produced more or less, uh, you could choose different words. One word might be perfect health or another word might be optimal health. Mm -hmm. And it's not the way that Americans eat today, or at least most Americans. And that got me thinking that uh, there, there is a traditional way of eating that is far better than the sort of modern way that most of us are used to. And when people eat the traditional way, they have far better health and even often recover from diseases which they might not otherwise. Uh, over the years, then, I tried to investigate. Uh, it's one thing to know that traditional diets are, quote, good. It's another thing to actually figure out what the actual components of a traditional diet are. So I'm, and I'm there's many... I was going to say, it's like, please tell more about what are the components of a traditional diet, because I think that might be a new term for some, because their traditional diet might be pizza and fast food, right? Right. So that's one kind of, I wouldn't call it a traditional diet. I would call it a modern diet. But right. uh, what, I, what I learned over the years was that there's a few principles of traditional diets, which pretty much all the successful human cultures have followed of whether they knew it or not they weren't necessarily knowing they were following certain rules but they were uh, so one of the rules is that all the people all the healthy successful traditional people ate some sort of animal foods and particularly full fat animal foods hmm. so some of them ate buffalo and some of them ate fish and some of them ate insects and some of them ate uh, full fat dairy products, and some of them ate chickens and fowl, and you name it, they ate it. Uh, but there was no vegan traditional successful cultures. So that's rule number one. Rule number one is generally speaking, they all ate some seeds, uh, some food that comes from seeds. And it could be grains or beans, that's the sort of modern version. Uh, traditionally, it was also things like. Uh, nuts that grow on trees and other seed food like sunflower seeds or something like that. But there was always some sort of seed component in the diet. And essentially the animal part was for fats and proteins, which is sort of like building the structure of your body. Mm -hmm. And the seed food has mostly carbo or has carbohydrates in it, which people use for energy. And then there was a third category, which is included in all traditional diets, which are uh, foods from vegetables and fruits. And I would say generally the percentage was around 80% vegetables and 20% fruit. And this is what I would call the vitamin pill component of the diet. So now we know that uh, vegetables have all these different phytonutrients and vitamins and minerals. 
Uh, some of them have names and some of them haven't been named yet. And these are the things that the plant uses to protect its own health. They're usually colors. They come under the names of flavonoids and polyphenols. And, you know, a plant will use uh, different colors, red colors, green colors, purple colors, basically as antioxidants and uh, nutrients to protect its own health. And my understanding is the way humans evolved was to use those same phytonutrients or plant nutrients to protect their own health and to treat their own diseases. So most of the medicines come from plants. Now, the repercussions of thinking of it like this is we don't eat like kale or green vegetables or purple vegetables, particularly for protein, fat, or even for carbohydrates. We eat them for their phytonutrient content, for their disease prevention and treatment content. And the other thing I found was that the average traditional diet uh, per year ate over 100 different plant, um, essentially 100 different vegetables. And these had a, a number of different colors, a number of different types of growth. Some were annual, some were perennials. Some were root vegetables, some were leaf vegetables, some were flower or fruit vegetables like a zucchini or a squash. But the diversity was the key. And so they ate small amounts of many different vegetables, like I say, all different colors, all different kinds, because then you avail yourself of all the nutrients that the plant world has to offer. So as I was thinking of this over the last 30 or so years, uh, being a kind of a food obsessed person in some ways, I tried to put it in practice, not only with me and my family, but with my patients. And so I would, uh, because I was a gardener, I started growing things and I started finding out perennial vegetables and different colored vegetables and different varieties. Because I also found out that when we switched from wild to cultivated vegetables, we tended to uh, select vegetables for higher sugar content because they tasted good, uh -huh. but lower nutrient content. I mean, we didn't select them for lower nutrient content, but they're much more, uh, much less dense in these phytonutrients than traditional wild or perennial vegetables. So my strategy was to bring back wild vegetables, perennial vegetables, diversity of vegetables, root vegetables, leaf vegetables, fruit vegetables into my diet and try to get 15 a day and 100 per year. And I can tell you that was a tough job because it's first of all involves a lot of growing and a lot of food processing and a lot of cutting and, you know, hours in the kitchen. And that was just hard work. But, you know, that was part of my life. So that's what we did. Eventually, I got to the point where uh, where I was had a successful sort of perennial garden, which is similar to permaculture. Uh, so I borrowed a lot from from permaculture ideas, and I was able to uh, definitely diversify my diet. But then I found out that you could actually take these vegetables and prepare them as if I was going to eat them and then dehydrate them, uh, make powders out of them, put them in mirin jars, which preserves the freshness. And you had, uh, it was no more difficult at that point to eat a wide variety of vegetables than to open up a box of Kellogg's cornflakes. Uh, so that was a kind of a revel revelation in the ease of diversifying the vegetable part of my diet. And that led us to uh, try to help other people do that by growing these vegetables and essentially powdering them, uh, processing them as we would cook, eat them ourselves, powdering them, put them in mirror and jars, and that became the origin of Dr. Cowan's garden business. Wow. And so now I'm imagining you kind of taking the vegetables and stuff, and now in, in my house it's like um, we'd love to bring in a chef. Her name's Chef Lon. She does a lot of Asian fusion-type cooking and stuff. Now are you saying when you're processing to the point 
where you where you eat them. It, I mean, she uses a lot of garlic and, and some oils and other things like that. Are you literally taking them to that level before you dehydrate them? Or, or tell me a little bit more about that process in terms of preparing them the way you would eat them and then dehydrating them. So, so the, the, the rule that I, I was following in this is I wanted to take the vegetables to the point where I generally ate them at home. So, for instance, there are some vegetables that I definitely eat raw, like I'll eat peppers raw, I'll eat tomatoes raw, I'll eat lettuce raw, I'll eat endive raw, radicchio, lots of vegetables like that. So if I was going to uh, dehydrate those, I would dehydrate them raw because that's how we eat them. On the other hand, uh, I don't believe that eating kale raw is a good idea because there's two reasons for that. One is that the nutrients in kale are too bound up in pretty hard to digest cellulose. So, and we're not particularly good at digesting cellulose, unlike a cow. So traditionally people, 100% did some sort of food processing, mostly cooking. So they boiled or steamed or something, put them in soups, and they would, uh, they would break down the greens and then they would eat them. And so that's what I do if I'm eating kale, I'll steam it or put it in a soup. So we, we typically blanch them before because that's the easiest way to do it on a fairly large scale. So we blanch the kale and we do it or the tree collards or, or whatever it is that's a sort of fibrous, tough green. Uh, the other reason is kale has anti-nutrients that are actually leached out when you, um, when you steam them or, or blanch them or boil them or, or one of those processes. And you can tell that because one of the rules of thumb that I go by of which, when am I going to eat a certain vegetable is I eat it when it looks and tastes the best because I trust that that's how the interaction of humans and plants evolved. So if you take kale as an example, it, ha it looks green and then you steam it and it looks greener and greener and tastes better and better. And then if you keep steaming it, it turns into basically uh, mush and it doesn't taste good or look good. It's at that exact moment. I mean, that's the art of cooking is to fix it at that moment when it looks the greenest and tastes the sweetest. So that's what this. we try to do. So we take, so yeah. we take the kale, we bring it to that point, and at that point we dehydrate it and essentially fix it at that point. And then you end up with ready to eat, you know, beautifully green, uh, you know, anti-nutrients removed, uh, highly bioavailable, nutritious kale powder. And that's also the difference between our powders and everybody else's, as far as I can see, because everybody else, it's, it's, it is expensive and time-consuming and a, basically a pain in the ass to do that. Mm -hmm. So they take kale and just dry it raw. And if that's why, you know, <laughs> pretty much everybody now has a bag of unused kale powder sitting in the back of their cupboard, which they took, you know, they used once and said, this doesn't taste good. And, and it, there it is sitting until it expires and then they throw it out. Whereas ours tastes good and is meant to be used with food. It's not a supplement. It's a addition to your food. So you put it on eggs, you put it in soup, you know, I mean, you could put it in smoothies or whatever, but it's ready to eat, and the taste is is great. If it doesn't taste good, we don't we don't sell it. So that's where we got this from. And you know, now on my counter, I have probably 50 different uh, jars of all different kinds of vegetables. Some of them we don't sell because I'm testing things out, and you know, I have the ability because I have a big garden to grow stuff that most people can't and that we can't even find commercially to grow them or to process them. So, but I, it's been, it's been a key in strategy for me to diversify our intake. Well, this is great stuff. I know that uh, the art of cooking, like you said, it's like that art of cooking really has a distinction 
that most people really don't respect when it comes to their own health and how that actually aligns with the intake of healthy production. It's like I know that right. I'll eat a lot less if I eat a lot less citrus if I have to eat it from the rind side, and it's it's a yeah. pretty good clue, right? And uh, yeah, and I know how my how my dad prepares the citrus or how we prepare citrus makes a huge difference as well. It's like my dad over the weekend we he loves to experiment and so he loves he's a great experimental cooker. So we had a big family meal and he says, "All right, I grilled." grapefruit we have so much grapefruit i need to find new ways to eat grapefruit and so he literally chopped them in half and he threw them on the grill and he thought this was a great idea i'd heard that somebody had done it before and so he, he, he sends them out and he's like who wants to be a guinea pig so he's handing out grapefruit halves that have been grilled and i dive into it like i would normally do grapefruit it is the worst grapefruit i've ever tasted in my entire life and uh in that <laughs> moment i was like uh, okay this is not the way to eat grapefruit and yeah, that's time, not a way to eat. No, but he's experimenting. You know, he's, he's playing around with stuff. This is how we kind of arrive, yeah, I think, at right. something, right? Everyone wants to try it out. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and then so I said, give me another one so I just remember what a grapefruit tastes like. And so I got a fresh one. We chilled it a little bit. And, you know, we have nice chilled grapefruit, cut it open in half, and we're just scooping it out from the inside. Love it. Nice pink, ruby red grapefruit. And, uh, and, and exactly what you're talking about. It's like the healthiest... The healthiest for us to eat it is likely the best tasting, and that's probably in every case. Now we can go overboard yeah. with the taste bud taste buds, though, right? Like I think of you can ruin your taste buds. There you go. The way the strategy to do that is to eat a lot of MSG and <laughs> and other things. But if you eat a lot of sugar, you will end up not having uh, you know reliable taste buds. So yeah. you have to go through a process where you only eat real food. And then, you know, I've been doing it for over 40 years. So I'm pretty good at uh, <laughs> sussing out. I can't eat unreal food. It just it doesn't, doesn't work for me. Yeah, a few years ago, I guess it was when I was in my early or late teens, early 20s, I kind of did similar as you. I, I went away and, and like you did the, uh, the Peace Corps. Like, how was yeah. that experience for you? I mean, it, how long did you do the Peace Corps work? I was in Southern Africa for two years. I, I mean, it was all right, except I didn't really, uh, I didn't think the mission was, was worth it, uh, you know, and I didn't think they would, I thought they would be a lot better off if the Americans basically left them alone. Mm. And that's, uh, but, that, that can be a reality. It was a good learning experience, so I'm sure for you, right? Yeah. It was, and I learned to garden, which has helped me for the rest of my life. I'm not sure that they learned much from me, but <laughs> I definitely learned how to garden. Well, I know when I, see, I spent a couple of years in Germany and I did a little more service work, it's, they're not really a Peace Corps kind of environment, especially in the you know late 90s. It wasn't a space where they needed a lot of help necessarily, but I did a lot of service work while I was there and helping inner city kids and things like that. But through the process, I got to... I didn't realize I was going to Germany to detox from my American diet, but the people that fed me there fed me from a lot more raw food kind of diet stuff. A lot of animal product, but it, it mixed in was a lot of real food. It was real cooked food. It was all fresh. And I really appreciated, yeah. it's like I could eat the, the German style foods I could eat a lot of and, and I could taste things. At first, everything tasted bland. But by the end of my two years there, I could really taste the flavors, the subtleties of everything. And I became this connoisseur of herbs. It's like I wanted to, I could taste the different herbs. And then I came back home and first thing I wanted to get was like some good old American pizza and a hamburger just because I hadn't had it forever. And when I tasted them the first time, I was, I was disgusted. And I couldn't, I was like, there's nothing in this thing. It's like, where's all the subtle yeah. flavors? I was, I was so curious to come back because I thought I'd, I'd be able to taste all these different subtle flavors, but there wasn't any. It was just a bunch of right. sugar, a bunch of fat, a bunch of salt, and I, was, I just couldn't eat hardly anything. And then I realized it was how we cooked it. And so I had to go back and uh, well, and the in, and the ingredients. Yeah, the ingredients, all the, the MSGs like you were talking about. It's like the processed stuff. That, uh, yeah, and even the, the cool. wheat is... is Poor quality wheat with no flavor in it. So yeah. it's it's a horrible way to eat. 
the not general. like the ancient grains like the faros or something like that because I've, I've re and re explored some of the more ancient grains and some of the more heirloom variety yeah. seeds and other things and i just love the flavors of those things right and and how they yeah, work we, we have an we have an impoverished cuisine an impoverished <laughs> uh you know taste spectrum in this country generally now what might be beautiful is that I'm actually doing this podcast uh, from one of our restaurants that we service. We actually do gardens around the restaurant, so they get their fresh herbs right into the restaurant. I'm here at the Bagels and Bialis in Scottsdale, and they've got a whole different menu um, because of the gardens, and I'm so grateful for it because of what they can do with the fresh stuff. And uh, and so it's kind of fun to be in a place that I think that the you know the restaurant tours, I think the the chefs nowadays are starting to wake back up that they've lost the flavor and they've lost the culture of, of creating good, healthy food and that it's all intertwined. It's like it, that food is thy medicine as who, who was that that said that was that uh, Socrates or was that uh, one of those old philosophers? Yeah. I don't know if you remember. Right. Yeah. Th- this is perfect. And, and I think what you've done too, is you've also created a product in a process that still helps people cater. Well, it kind of helps still cater to that, speedy lifestyle approach people that aren't willing to wait for slow food yep. but still get all the benefits yep. from it right and, and you know one of our uh, signature products is this is this blend we call the perennial greens blend and that's because um, the basically the difference between perennial and annuals perennials are plants that live more than one year is they typically have deeper root systems and you don't need to disturb the soil as much. And because they have deeper root systems, they're able to mine for nutrients that are typically not available to annual plants. And so they're much more nutrient concentrated. And the other thing is because they have a longer life, they have to produce more of these protective phytonutrients than your typical annual plant, which can kind of get its life over with and Hope it doesn't get eaten before the two months are up. So the 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 four ingredients in this perennial greens blend, three of which I grow in our Napa garden. One are tree collards, which is a collard green, so it's in the the cabbage or brassicas family. It's essentially a cabbage or kale that has forgotten how to go to seed, so it becomes like a a woody, you know shrub kind of small tree which makes this profuse explosion of very calcium rich nutrient rich uh, collard greens which are called tree collards they're a little stronger in taste than your typical cabbage or kale but that's because they are more concentrated in nutrients so you know we have about 140 foot rows of of tree collards, which we just harvest the leaves, blanch them, dry them, make them into powder. Now, for uh, people another, to get an idea of how these things look, because I think so. Tell me, maybe you can describe also kind of how big these things are. How tall do these these typically get as you're harvesting them? I mean, tree collards get to about 10 to 12 feet high. Wow. They also live about 12 to 15 years. So they're they're like a small tree or a big bush which is basically growing kale on the, or collard greens on the tree. And um, again, it's in the same family as those. So it has all the, you know, beneficial nutrients of kale or collards or Brussels sprouts or broccoli. But like I say, it's lost the ability to go to seed generally, occasionally it does. And so it just keeps living unlike your typical kale plant, which goes to seed and then dies. I love it. So tell us more the about other it. Yeah. part of that. Yeah. Another component of that blend is called Genura procumbens, which is otherwise known as Okinawan spinach. And it's also called longevity spinach. And it's in some circles considered the reasons why Okinawans live so long is they eat a lot of this spinach. And it's, it's a different, kind of annual uh, sorry perennial it doesn't grow on trees it doesn't make woody branches but it basically uh, sends up a a a 
a explosion of greens in the spring and then it dies back in the fall and then it comes back in the same place the next year. And as it does that, it develops a bigger and bigger root system. The interesting thing about this plant, it you can eat it raw, but it's also lightly cooked. It has a sort of spinach-ish taste, although it's not in the spinach family. But it has a chemical in it which seems to be as effective in the treatment of diabetes as our conventional diabetic drugs. Wow. So it basically helps uh, reduce blood sugar. It helps inflammation. And that could be the reason why it's uh, so associated with longevity because a big part of, of what happens when people age is they lose their ability to manage their blood sugar. So apparently if you eat a daily helping of longevity spinach or Okinawan spinach, otherwise known as genura, that will help with that. Uh, another component is Malabar spinach, which is uh, native to India and Ceylon, I guess. And it grows like a vine. So it'll grow even 20, 30 feet in a, in a year's time. And it makes these heat loving, very succulent leaves, which also have a kind of spinach like taste. They're a little bit more succulent than spinach. And they're known for having a strong amount of fiber, which is very good for the health of the colon. Uh, it has a different strategy of being a perennial, which is basically it reseeds itself. And so in the next, you get this continual reseeding of, of Malabar in the same place. You put a trellis, it grows up the trellis, it dies back in the winter and then it comes back in the in the spring so we put the we grow those three in our garden in napa and we put those we dry them put them in our blend along with a the leaves of a tree called moringa tree also known as the tree of life which we get from a friend who sustainably harvested it from the sonoran desert and moringa has pretty much every mineral, every amino acid, almost every nutrient that's ever been found. It's extremely nutritious leaves. Uh, there's a group called the Leaf for Life people who say that, you know, eating Moringa leaves will wipe out malnutrition. And so they're planting Moringa leaves all over the tropics to help people with their access to nutrients and greens. So we mix those four together and that's called our perennial greens powder or perennial greens blend. And that blend really speaks to what we're trying to do, which is grow things in the best way. Perennials need less care of the soil. So there's no plowing involved. There's no disturbing of the soil. They basically take care of themselves. So it's a very sustainable, ecological way to grow things. And, you know, four of the most nutritious green vegetables probably on the planet. Now, I've had experience with all of these in growing them in my own garden. Actually, even today, I just came from a, a client property. We've been growing um, two very large Moringa trees, and we just trimmed those things. Those things are incredible, fast-growing trees, and we, we love them, and they trim, they trim down real nice. We, we actually have to trim them down about every every year just in order to keep them harvestable at the level that we that we uh, can reach but very fast growing tree and we love the flavor of those those leaves and even the flowers now if you, you guys do much with the pods have you talked more about even the pods and how the pods are used? yeah we haven't no we haven't we haven't got into using the pods uh, we don't right now have a source for them but mm -hmm. if anybody does have a source we'd be interested well we might want to talk about that because we have uh, some pretty good, we've cultivated some varieties that uh, that grow a very large pod, very um, very large pod and very prolific on the trees, like thousands per tree. Right. Uh, and very large, like, you know, two feet long and about at least an inch, inch and a half in diameter. So very large pods for some of these ones for us. So we don't want to talk about that later, but we yeah. want to talk about that now. <clears throat> Let's just yeah. So okay. I, you've basically taken all the best stuff perennial wise that are the greens and put them into that powder and is it just as easy as you talked about? You kind of take them to the best stage. And what is the best stage for, for the Moringa? Is it just, is it fresh, dehydrated, and then ground? Or what, what do you do with that? Yeah, Moringa, we just dehydrate it and um, 
you know, he de he dehydrates it for us in basically shade dehydration. Wow. Uh, lays it out in 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 the shade in in uh, under under some cover, and we get these basically dried moringa leaves, which we grind together with the with the other ones. The tree collards we blanch. The uh, Malabar is pretty much raw, maybe a a five second blanch. And the genera is similar. It doesn't need much. Uh, you can basically eat it raw or very lightly blanched. So with the moringa, do you guys use typically the red red veined ones or the green vein? Uh, I think it's the green vein. Okay. I'd have to check on that, but that's what I think. See, I remember talking to your son too, and we were talking about the berries and and just have you guys been doing things with the berries or the seeds as well? Uh, we haven't. I know a little bit about that, but uh, you know, we're sort of looking for anybody who has a good supply of any kind of edible wild vegetable. We would be interested in turning it into powders. That, cool. That's sort of what we're about. Is is the, because the missing piece in in the modern diet are these perennial and wild vegetables, and yeah. the irony is those are the most nutritious, far more than your usual, you know, lettuce or something that we grow in the garden. I'm not saying anything's wrong with lettuce or kale or those things, but the, the wild and perennial ones are more concentrated flavors and nutrients. And so we're, our, our, our challenge is to source these from the most sustainable, the most ecologically, you know, healthy sources and then we can turn them into a product. Well, I think hopefully long-term our agriscaping network will be able to support a lot of that for you. So we'll have to talk about that in terms of volumes that you're looking for and things. Because um, we love the Sonoran Desert growing areas. That's where we do a lot of our growing as well. As well as we've got people around the country, so in different parts of the country. I think we're in 24 different states right now with different people growing or, or educating in their spaces to bring back a lot of the same stuff that you're talking about in quantities that can be harvestable and integrated into the food economy. So we'll have to talk about right. that more. So this, and for all yeah, the, that, everybody that. out there listening, it's like, pay attention. See, you can see and hear the demand. Dr. Cowan's really talking about where demand is going and where health is going to come from as we move forward into the future. And the demand is in growing of it. And so for all you that have that interest, that passion, that heart for it, I mean, please, you know, get in touch with us on the Agriscaping Network. Check us out at agriscaping.com. Look at the coursework that we have. You know, we got a whole thing on how to go pro and uh, be able to start doing some of this to start cultivating the types of crops that can influence the health of your local community as well as the community at large. So I'm loving the subject here. Right. This is, yeah, I mean, this is the future of, of farming and gardening and making living from a small space. Yeah. Because if you, if you, if you can, you know, we're talking about, in, improve, improve nutrient and flavor profiles, which is where it's at. And, you know, you can grow a lot more on a small area than you can corn and soybeans and things like that. Oh, yeah. So that's what, that's what people should be transitioning to. It's far healthier. It's far more ecological, sustainable. It's far healthier for the planet, for people, for communities. And what we hope we can do is, you know, provide the intellectual content, which is sort of what I'm doing now, why people would even bother to want to eat these things, because that it has to start there. And the, the sort of processing ability to take these, these wild, nutritious vegetables, perennial vegetables that people can grow and turn them into a viable product. Because as you say, not everybody is going to have the inclination or even the space or the wherewithal to do it themselves. Right. And so this is, and this is cool. The Malabar spinach, that, that for one, I've never seen it in a product before. And so I love that you've been able to find a more, uh, another use for it because we can grow that stuff so easy here in the Phoenix area. We love that thing. That thing literally does grow year round. It never even dies back for us because it doesn't get cold enough. Yeah. And uh, right. I mean, we get leaves. The and it size makes of an plates. incredible. It makes an incredible amount of leaves from one plant. Yes. <laughs> you, you have to almost shoot it to get it to stop. Right. Uh, 
and and for us, I mean, we've act, we've been we've been kind of trying to sell it on on restaurants for a number of years, and we we finally found a way that the restaurants started taking it. And it's we'd get them about a saucer size leaves, so we get them up to that size leaf, and then they'll use them as a taco shell or a wrap. We get the plate size leaves, and they'll use them as a as a wrap, like that they can do almost instead of a uh, instead of a, a tortilla. You know, they'll use they'll use the Malabar leaf because they're so big, yeah. they're succulent, and uh, they've got a nice crunch to it. That's why they they work for a great for a taco shell. If you if you want to go back to the taco shells or even a vegan taco shell, we have a restaurant called Bitters in Scottsdale. Did a vegan taco shell with those things. Fun plant. And like you said, it's one that you can pretty much take fresh. It's not one that really needs to be cooked down. That one's one that get, will get mushy real quick if you cook it too much, right? Yeah, right. So it's you can eat it either raw or just like literally five seconds of steaming. Just brings out the flavor a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's one that it's just a nice, almost a, a, I guess it's not really a blanching. It's more the steaming. I was about to say we'd, we'd, we'd blanch it, but I don't think we do it even that. It, a nice little steaming process. Um, yeah, we love the Malabar spinach. That one, that one lot of, it's got a different flavor, though, too. We find that it's a very strong flavor for the size leaf that it is. And, right. uh, but wonderful. I mean, we only have to throw a couple in a smoothie yeah, makes to it, turn the whole thing green, right? Yeah, and it makes a great powder. Very flavorful, very just really dark green. I mean, it's incredible the, the, amount of chlorophyll and greenness in a Malabar spinach. Oh. And, you know, our, our Malabar does die back, but, but the garden in Napa, I mean, it'll, if you put a trellis 30 feet high, it'll, it'll make it to yeah. the top it'll, in it'll a take month. It. Yeah, we do subterranean gardening sometimes, and that was a plant that we did a test run in my subterranean garden. So underneath the trampoline, we got this terraced garden under the trampoline. And I just put three little plants down in there, and by the end of my summer, my entire underneath my entire trampoline was totally loaded with Malabar. It had taken over the entire space. So I was like, right. well, word of the wise, I can't put it in there unless I'm willing to harvest it on a regular basis. And right. So it's, uh, it is a very fast-growing, wonderful vine. And I know the red vein variety, we love the beauty of that one. You put it on a nice white trellis, give it something hardy to stand on, and the wonderful dark red berries... The berries don't taste like much. I, I compare them to a cucumber more than anything else. It's not a real fruit. There's nothing sweet about that, those berries. Yeah. But it's a fun thing to have. It looks like a blackberry. And, yeah, it uh, like a... It's like part of a blackberry kind of got stuck to a, a stem or something. Yeah. That's a really cool plant. Well, this is this is great. I'm, I've been loving this conversation. I think everybody that you know listens to this, they they'll dive in and they'll, they'll really get to hear what you're saying as well as looking forward to finding you. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about that real quick. Uh, so I'm going to go back over to your website. You guys have been, if you've been watching along, I've been go, pulling up pictures of all the items we've been talking about so you can see what they look like. And um, the Dr. Cowan's garden, just drcowansgarden.com. That's the easiest place to find them. And the product itself, you can see I've got it pulled up right now, perennial greens powder. And you can read more about that yourself, get some good reminders. And um, maybe we can talk just a little bit more before we end on, um, on some of the health benefits and kind of the frequency at which someone would be using this type of powder and how they might use it. I mean, the health benefits are the same, you know, as you would get from eating broccoli or kale. There's, uh, again, it's all, the, it's all about these polyphenols and antioxidants and phytonutrients. And, that they all contain these sulfur-containing uh, chemicals, which basically prevent cancer and heart disease and macular degeneration and all those kind of things. The 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 genera is specifically an anti-diabetic plant, and Malabar is best known for its intestinal health slash fiber, and moringa because it's basically like a vitamin pill. So that that's the blend and. You know, people ask a lot about how to use them. And again, these are meant not as a vitamin pill per se, but for cooking. So, for instance, if you make salad dressing and you make oil and vinegar, for instance, you might put a teaspoon of perennial greens powder in your salad dressing and then you you just put that over your your whatever is in your salad and you've now made a more nutrient-dense salad dressing. 
Uh, so that's one way. Another way is pretty much every morning I'll have my soup, which I saute some vegetables, and then I put three or four different powders, maybe a teaspoon or a half a teaspoon of each into the soup. And so instead of five vegetables, I now have 15 vegetables. So I have sea vegetables, which is, I think, three different sea vegetables, perennial greens blend, so that's seven, uh, beet powder, that's eight, plus the you know, carrots and leeks and onions and and whatever other green I have in the actual the in, in actual vegetable that I put in the soup. So that's that's another way. Uh, you can sprinkle it on eggs to add nutrients to to you know soft boiled eggs, hard boiled eggs, uh, you know sautéed eggs or whatever you call that, pan fried eggs. It's you know, and there's whole recipe books and. We also have a recipe section on the website of uh, one of my sons in particular is a pretty expert chef and my wife has made a lot of recipes and people uh, write in with recipes. So they'll tell you how to make uh, beet powder brownies, uh, crusted sole with, you know, kale and leek powder, all these things. I, I don't, I haven't read the recipes lately so i don't know what's there but yeah these are uh, a lot of people using one, the it says garbanzo bean pancakes you know i got that one there we got leek fiddlehead omelet i mean you got yeah, uh, right. fried plantain hash with swiss chard and pork sausage i mean this is some great stuff yeah. and this is a good balanced diet this isn't a you know you got some vegan options as well as vegetarian options and you got some more um, omnivore options you got everything in here this is good right yeah we got it. everything and th and that's that brings it to life for people too. It's like you know you can't imagine just eating powder all the time. Um, you know this isn't that. No, strict. you don't just eat. You don't just eat a teaspoon of powder. Although I've seen people do that, but yeah, um, you can put it in anything. It's it you know when you powder a vegetable, it concentrates not just the nutrients but the flavors. In fact, I must confess, I stole this powdering idea from a, a cookbook. That, that was of a very well-known San Francisco high-end restaurant. And they, their signature was to, they had like 60 or 70 or I don't know how many different powders that they used to flavor their food. And for them, it was all about flavor. They probably didn't care that much about the nutrient content, but, you know, they used charred eggplant powder to flavor fish and Wow. To make put into hummus and it it was out of this world and I saw their their book with this lineup of powders and I had you know a, a surplus of you know a whole acre of of garden produce that I kind of didn't know what to do with so I made it into powders that's awesome and it's, it's cool to hear the story too because your passion and what you had you know kind of turned into something because you had excess of it you had an abundance and now that abundance, yeah. and, as well as the perspective of that abundance, has now been converted into a product that people can then purchase and and have ready ready access for themselves. Now, I noticed on the the bottle it says it'll hold 50 servings, and that one teaspoon is equivalent to a serving. But in terms of volume, if someone tried to eat that many servings of of uh, of these kale, I can only imagine how big uh, how much volume you'd have to try to eat in the fresh veg in order to get that same one size serving. Do you, any idea, kind of how what's the volume of of uh, of greens, those perennial greens that you'd have to eat to equivalent that one teaspoon serving size. Uh, I I don't know exactly. I my guess is that like four big kale leaves is about a teaspoon of powder. Wow! So if you can imagine four, that four yeah. big kale leaves is a lot of kale to eat. And you got to cook you down know, the kale. So we're talking about. And you got to and for some like my brother, it's like we we wear shirts. I guess we wear shirts with agriscaping that says, they say kale yeah on it because we're excited about kale. But my brother, right. you know, he, he, he wants the kale no shirt. And so he doesn't like kale. He doesn't like anything about kale. If we bring it up, it's a, it's a problem for him. And so putting it in a powder form like this and be able to mix it into some of his favorite dishes, you know, he loves hummus or he loves, you know, he loves some of these things that you've got on these recipes. Man, what a, what a great way to get the good health and nutrition without, with, by, by and bypassing, I guess some of his uh, tasted version, I guess you could say. Right, 
And, you know, it's interesting because I, I sometimes talk out of both sides of my mouth on this because I'll say, on the one hand, uh, you can use these powders to flavor your food. And so you can make more flavorful, you know, whatever you're eating. On the other hand, you can also use this to disguise vegetables like for children. Uh -huh. Because you can you can make, you know, macaroni and cheese with kale powder and you can call it, you know, green fairy dust or sprinkles. And they won't really taste kale uh, because you, it just gets mixed in with the whole mess. So you can sneak vegetables in that they wouldn't do otherwise just by using them as powders. And it makes a really interesting color scheme <laughs> if you want to go that route. Yeah. And you end up, you know, getting your children to eat vegetables that they wouldn't eat otherwise uh, or people, uh, adults who don't want to eat vegetables. You just sprinkle some kale on their fish and they won't hardly notice it. Well, this is a great way to trick our kids into being healthy, right? I'm just kidding. But this, it's, it's kind of real. For some kids, we kind of have to, especially if they've had their taste buds really spoiled by all the foods and the, the, the MSGs and other things that they might have otherwise been eating. And so I appreciate right. that perspective as well. And, and many of you that are gardening at home, you also know that other trick. By having them grow something, they are more interested in eating it. And they, they find that the flavor is much better as well. And just like we find with broccoli, it's like my kids... My kid that was most adverse to eating broccoli now loves broccoli, mainly because of the flowers. He loves the flowers. He loves them when they're getting to the, that bud stage because they sweeten up. They're tender, more tender. They don't need to be cooked at that point, and they just are amazing um, to eat. And so now my son, he, he's always asking, well, is this from our garden? If there's ever broccoli on a table, is this from our garden? If it's not from our garden, he usually passes on it, which is an yeah. interesting thing. But he loves, and he loves sharing it. He was even sharing it with his class uh, this week. Um, and I'm, I'm just so excited for how excited he is about healthy food now, where he was, he was just a pizza kid when he, you know, he was first starting to become aware of his food. It was pizza and fries and we couldn't get him to eat much of anything else, but now he yeah. eats a full balanced diet and he's really looking forward to it every day because he's been growing. He's been around it more. And we found recipes like your, you got here that really help him respect and, and, uh, the nourishment that he's gaining from it. Right. Yep. Well, we're getting pretty close to our time here. Again, you want to find him at drcowensgarden.com. That's where you'll find a lot about him, his products, as well as his recipes are right there on the site. I've got them pulled up on the page so you can see it right now. We'll have links on our site as well as uh, other ways that you can learn more about how to grow it for yourself on our page at agriscaping.com. So any other final thoughts, Dr. Cowan, before we uh, close up for today? Uh, just if anybody has uh, some sort of unusual, wild, flavorful, perennial, whatever vegetable, they should uh, contact us and we, we can see if we can incorporate it, that into our products because we're also interested in helping people make a living. Wonderful. And the more small farmers who have small businesses we can support, that, that really is a core mission of our business. Wonderful. I love it. And uh, we're definitely in the same page on that. It sounds like uh, our businesses will, will likely align very well. I'm looking forward to talking to you more about the things that our people are already growing and searching through our network. We, we can probably help you find some of these things that you're looking to grow and these unique stuff. I mean, one of them I know, uh, Purslane. Have you guys used Purslane much in what you're doing? Wild greens? Uh, we haven't. We've thought about it. I haven't really made a powder out of it, so I, I think it would be fine. But you know, we'd have to try it out, make a powder, see how it tastes and everything. But, yeah, purslane is definitely an interesting vegetable. So, And that's one that uh, we've, got a, we've got a native variety here in the Phoenix area that is very easy for us to grow. Very, It's got a lemony flavor to it. It's got a good high uh, omega-3 content in it as well. And so it might be a fun one that we can play around with right. and see what we can do. And it tastes yeah. good because I've certainly tasted a number of them that were culinary that didn't taste very good. And I liked our yeah. wild version way, way better. Whoops. Yeah, good. Yeah, no, you should contact us. And, uh, we, you know, Asher and Joe mostly take care of that cool. and uh, see what we can do. It's a big family business for you, and it is for us. And thanks for joining me on this podcast today and the rest of the Agriscaping family. We look forward to talking to you again real soon. And uh, hopefully you guys all have a great time checking out all these awesome recipes on Dr. Cowan's 
Garden.com, as well as the products that he's got, learning more about it. It's good to know why things are healthy. You know, just, don't just think, you know, when someone says eating vegetables is healthy, I love the knowledge that Dr. Cowan has that he's willing to share with you. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everybody.